Okay, so let's look at some of the problems that they have. So what are the points of contention? What do they not like? They don't like vestments. Vestments is what the clergy wear during worship, okay? The godly, these kind of stalwart reformed Protestants, they liked the plain black gown. They did not like the surplice or the colors that changed through the liturgical year. They just found that was fancy fancy and not appropriate. Okay, that's dressing up, we shouldn't do that. It's almost um, spiritual vanity, just don't go there. Okay, don't do that. They honestly were not very comfortable with the English church's structure. It had bishops, right? There's English bishops. Think of the Archbishop of Canterbury still today, right? The godly said, we shouldn't do that. We should have a Presbyterian form of government with councils and classes and synods and things like that, but not bishops. They did not like bishops. Liturgy. You'll not be surprised to realize that the godly get kind of upset by certain actions in worship. They were very uncomfortable with people making the sign of the cross. That felt way too Catholic. The sacrament of confirmation was a problem for them. They didn't like that. They didn't like people bowing at the name of Jesus or exchanging rings during a wedding. All of these things felt too <laughs> traditional, non-biblical, too Catholic. We shouldn't do them. They had a very strict view of the Sabbath. The godly felt that the Sabbath was for worship and pretty much nothing else. And they didn't like the observation of other feast days, traditional feast days of the church, like the feast days of the Virgin Mary. And they didn't want to see those observed. Even some other traditional feast days like Christmas, they were not that sure about that. It felt like it was a bit superstitious that you should do that. Okay. They were very much like church discipline done at the local level in the level of the parish, not by the bishop. Fair enough. They really emphasized preaching, and they felt that the English church did not sufficiently emphasize preaching. And they were not happy with public prayer in church being a rote prayer, something you read out. They wanted ex-pastors and church leaders to pray without a text in front of them. They felt the text was cold and formulaic and not what you should do. Okay, so they've got all these problems. Now, none of them on their own seem like so big of a deal, right? Surely you should be able to cope with your pastor wearing vestments if that's what he does, right? But all these together made some English Protestants feel not at home in the Church of England. And increasingly, they wanted to worship differently. Now, they went in two different directions. And one way to see a visual of how they were unhappy is to look exactly at the picture which I showed you. Now, if you know a little bit of Latin, at the top on the left, it says opera lucis, the works of light. And on the other side, the opera tenebraro, the works of darkness. Okay, so let's look at the first one. On the left, what are the people doing? Top of the page. They're worshiping, they're praying, and that's the Bible in the center, okay? So the Bible front and center. And on the right? Well, we've been partying, I think, and we're going to have a little nap. And especially if it's Sunday morning, that's not the time to be napping. Okay. Number two, it's a little hard to see. What do you think is going on on the left? Preaching. Preaching. Good. The man in the pulpit, the people listening reverently, and that's great. And on the right? Hey, we're dancing. Party, party, party. Bad idea from this author's point of view. All right, the next one's maybe a little more mysterious. What do you think that gentleman is doing? Meditating. Yeah, he's doing his private devotions, right? He's doing household worship. He's reading scripture and reflecting on what he's reading. And on the other side? Playing cards. They're playing cards, which obviously was not what you were supposed to be doing. All right, let's try the fourth one. What's happening on the left? Visiting the, sick. Visiting the sick is exactly right. So comforting the sick, that's a work of the Sabbath that's appropriate. And on the right, more party, 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 let's have a nice big dinner. Okay, that's not appropriate. All right. And finally on the bottom, could you figure out what's going on there? Giving to the poor. Giving to the poor, absolutely. And on the other side? Working. Working. And you're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath, right? So this picture kind of lays out the strong Sabbatarian trends in among these godly 
the people who felt that the Church of England was losing its way, <coughs> excuse me, losing its way spiritually. So what happened? Well, some continued to seek reform from within the Church of England. Eventually, they become known as the Puritans. Others decide that further reform in the Church of England is not actually possible, or it's highly unlikely, and they decide to set up separate communities of faith. And they are known as the separatists and eventually as the pilgrims. So pilgrims and puritans are both within the overall umbrella term of the godly, but they take two different paths. One says, we'll stay in England and make changes from within, as far as we can and as much as we can. And the other group says, mm -mm, this is not working. We'll make our own churches. But the problem was the government in England did not want to see separate churches. That's not way they're going to do things. They want parish churches with everybody worshiping together. So the separatists did not feel at home in England, and they are the ones who take that first step and head out actually towards the Netherlands. All right, so let's have a quick survey here. I just want to have a sense of this. Raise your hand if you were born in another country and emigrated to the United States. Raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up. If your parents, either of them, emigrated to the United States, raise your hand. If your grandparents, any of them, emigrated to the United States, raise your hand. Okay, look at that. Almost everyone's hands are up by now. Well done. So you kind of get a sense of your own history being a history of people who have moved, right? They were in a place, and now they are somewhere else entirely. So you should have some fellow feeling for these English people as they headed for a new location where they thought they might be able to live more freely. So some of the challenges, and you know this, right, from your own experience, some of the challenges if you were, for instance, in the Netherlands and you moved to the United States, well, there's a whole language you have to learn. There's a new culture you have to adapt to. There's a whole environment and way of doing things that's different. It can be very stressful, right? And there's quite a lot of stress in immigrant communities as people try to find their way in that new place. And maybe the job you had when you lived at home, you can't have it in a new place and you have to do something else entirely. And that's hard too, right? So families have a lot of adjustments to make. And this is exactly the same kinds of challenges that these English separatists found when they decided that they would move from England to the Netherlands. So that is kind of where, you're, where the challenge takes off. <coughs> so why did they move? Well, they wanted a safe place to worship, somewhere where they would be free from arrest or imprisonment or physical punishment, all of which were a potential problem in England if you were a separatist, okay? if you wanted to make your own separate congregation. So why the Netherlands? That seems like an interesting choice, right? Well, if you think about it, geographically, it's not that far, right? If you're going from England to the Netherlands, that's pretty close by. You're not going far, far away. That's one. Number two, the Dutch Republic was officially reformed, Protestant and reformed. Not Episcopalian, not Church of England, not Catholic. It was officially, and by government order, it was reformed. So they think, okay, good. It's not too far. It's also reformed. This is great. Here we go. This is going to be fine. That's what they think. However, there are challenges. It's not easy. And we're going to talk about some of these challenges in a moment. But some of the problem is that the people who left in England had been farmers. But there were no farms available for them in the Dutch Republic. The Dutch Republic was quite increasingly urbanized, right? So the job you did in England, you can't do it in the Dutch Republic at this time. So you have to do something else. And maybe that's a downgrading of your economic situation. That's one problem. They found adapting to the Dutch language was a challenge. Okay, Going from English to Dutch is just as hard as going from Dutch to English. It's not obvious how you do that. That's another problem. But then there are some deeper concerns. And these ones surfaced the longer they were in the Dutch Republic. And here's one of the main ones, and see if you can understand this. The concerns of those who went from England to the Dutch Republic was not so much for themselves, but for their children. <coughs> and their worry, specifically, was that their children would be acculturated to Dutch culture. 
and might marry a Dutch boy or a Dutch girl instead of a good English boy or a good English girl, and might first and settle in the Dutch Republic. And the Dutch culture, yes, it was reformed, but it wasn't as strict as those separatists wanted. So it's kind of like a little bit of a challenge, right? They go with these high hopes. Oh, we'll go to the Dutch Republic. It'll be great. They're reformed like we want to be reformed. And then they realize, no, not really, OK? It's the Dutch culture was more relaxed about certain things, including Sabbath observance. They were not as strict about some points of doctrine as the separatists were. So the separatists, they come with high hopes, but the reality isn't always what they thought they would be, right? And that's a challenge. And then they're worried that their children will go down that road, and that's not the road that the separatists want. So it's kind of a, an interesting story to think about what that would be, what that would be like. So let's see, first of all, before we go more into the problems, what actually happened, OK? So how did they get over there, and what happened as they settled in? So I'm now on point B, Puritan churches in exile. So the first ones who went across were these separatists, OK? These separatists who want to have their own congregations independent from the government church in England. And the first ones came to the city of Middelburg in the Netherlands in 1581. And they were the followers of a particular man. His name was Robert Brown. Let's see if I can get on from there. Robert Brown. There's actually no picture that I could find of Robert Brown. An interesting character. Um, he was born in England in 1549. He studied in Cambridge which was the academic heartland for the godly, for these stalwart Protestants. He served as a chaplain to the Duke of Norfolk, so he's a pretty important position. And he increasingly was attracted by the theology of the godly and repelled by the hierarchy of the Church of England. He doesn't like bishops. Okay. And so increasingly, Robert Brown urged others to make a change. And here's a quotation from him. He said, Every true Christian was to leave such parishes, the parishes of the Church of England, and to seek the Church of God wheresoever. Okay, so he's, the, he's a man who says we need to break away. We need to do our own thing. All right. So uh, Brown and others who followed his ideas left England. They set up their own church in Middleburg, and it wasn't an easy time. Because the Dutch government was sort of scratching its head with all these English people suddenly starting up, showing up, and wanting to do their own separate churches. Honestly, the Dutch were not any more happy with separate churches than the English were. I mean, they wanted their churches to be reformed, but they weren't sure about these kind of squirrely English people turning up and, and, and being rather contentious, honestly. It wasn't the best kind of situation from the Dutch government point of view. Um, the Dutch government consistently prohibited public worship from anybody else than the Reformed. Now, you could, if you were Lutheran or Catholic, worship very quietly in the Netherlands. That was OK. But you couldn't be public and in front of everybody. The, the only public churches were the Reformed churches. So the Brownists, they call themselves after Robert Brown, these Brownists, they worship in their private homes. They gather together in their homes. Um, but it didn't go too well. And honestly, part of this is, and, and maybe you can understand this, um, people who split once tend to split again. Do you know what I mean? In other words, if you are someone who feels like, well, I have to take a stand and move away because this is now the pure church, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That will continue, right? Because the next one coming up behind will look at you and say, you're not the pure church. This is the pure church. No, 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 this is the pure church, right? So split, split, split down the road. And honestly, a lot of the people who were among the separatists, it's fair to say they're pretty contentious characters, right? They're not easygoing. They're not Mr. Compromise. Um, they tend to stand firm on their principles, but it makes it hard for them to get along with other people, honestly. And that was a problem. So there's divisions in the group. Um, there are more moderates, there's more hardliners among the Brownists. Robert Brown himself was a hardliner. 
He was easily angered by people with whom he did not agree, uh, people who did not want to follow his teaching. Um, three times in two years, he resigned as pastor. Okay, imagine as a congregation, oh, but hey, here he goes again, he's resigning. Um, and he had to be coaxed back every time by his followers. No, 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 please come back, and so on. It's a little bit emotionally draining, okay? After, so they came over in 1581. By 1583, the congregation had largely fallen apart, okay? Factionalism, friction, problems. Um, Robert Brown returned to England, spent time in Scotland, was arrested in England and Scotland 32 times over the next three years because he was someone who would never, ever, ever be quiet and just quietly live out. But eventually, by the later 1580s, he returns to the Church of England and dies as a minister in the Church of England. So he goes a whole 183, 60 around, okay? So this, this uh, little plaque is in England, and it says, to the memory of Robert Brown, a founder of the Brownists, or Independents, rector of Thorpe, a church in 1591 to 1631, was buried in this churchyard in 1633, <coughs> A tribute to a life wherein, among many things obscure, one thing shone brightly, that Christ was by him exalted as head above all. <clears throat> Erected by Congregationalists in connection with a visit to Northampton in 1923 of the Congregational Union of England and Wales. Okay, so uh, a man who is remembered as the founder of one of these separatist groups, but who himself could not keep his church together, right? It just kept on splitting and fragmenting further along. The next group of separatists left England in the early 1590s. They arrived in Amsterdam in 1593, started a church by 1596, uh, which was eventually known as the Ancient Church. So they're giving themselves a bit of, I don't know, length or history or something. Um, they had a number of men as their leaders. I put some of their names down on your sheet. Henry Ainsworth, Francis Johnson, they were able to acquire buildings in which to worship. They had a succession of leaders, some of whom stayed for a while. Um, but again, dissent kind of shadows these groups all the way along. And I want to tell you a little more of the story of this man in the middle. This is John Smith, S-M-Y-T-H, John Smith. He arrived from England in 1606. He had been a member of the Church of England then became attracted to the idea of the Brownists and the other separatists. He created a separate congregation in Amsterdam, perhaps because the first separatist group had their own pastor, and there was no room in him for him in leadership, so he decides to make his own church separately, and you can kind of see where we're going, okay? Um, so there's an ancient church, and then there's Smith's church, and they're in the same neighborhood in Amsterdam. They're like right next door to each other. And, um, Smith was a man who took every idea he found and pushed it to the utmost, okay? The furthest point he could ever get, that's where he wanted to be. So, he said, set texts and set prayers are bad because they attempt to restrict the Holy Spirit and cage the Holy Spirit into formulas. We don't want to do that, okay? He said, there should be no singing in church because singing is tied to set forms and set forms are bad, okay? He decided the only valid versions of scripture were in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. English translations had too great a risk of human distortion of the text. Okay? So the pastor was to read the text to the congregation in the original Hebrew and Greek, and then he would explain it in English. Okay, good luck if you want to listen to the Bible reading. That could be a little challenging. Ultimately, Smith was convinced that infant baptism was wrong and unbiblical, and the only real baptism was believer's baptism administered to adults who made a confession of faith. Okay? Well, he came to that point, but then the problem in his congregation was who would be the person doing the baptizing, because everybody had been baptized as an infant. So his way around the problem was he made his confession of faith in front of the congregation and then baptized himself. And then he baptized everybody else who wanted to go on. So can you see how this is not going to go in good directions? Okay, It tends to be a problem. Eventually, um, Smith ended up with the Mennonites. Okay, Because you can kind of see him moving in that direction. And he ended up excommunicated by all the other separatists who wanted nothing to do with him. So you can, these stories are 
somewhat funny, right? Good grief. But at the same time, it's sad, too, and sometimes also a bit familiar, right? We've, we've seen this kind of thing before. While Smith was doing his own thing with his own church, the rest of the separate, um, here it seems to have been mostly a clash of personalities. There were two brothers, Francis Johnson and George Johnson, and they both were in leadership in the ancient church. The problem was, and again this sounds almost comical, um, Francis's wife was a lady called Thomason, and Thomason Johnson had a fairly wealthy background and liked to dress well. George objected to his sister-in-law's fancy dressing and considered that this was a problem in the leadership of the church. Um, he, he thought that her clothes were not appropriate for a pastor's wife. Okay, so he gets all upset about this. Um, it's a minor issue, but it causes major turmoil. Uh, George gets passed over as an elder. He ends up being excommunicated because his brother Francis pressured the congregation to excommunicate his own brother. Um, basically, it was a control issue. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to get to say what happens in this church? The tension between Francis and George got so bad that their father had to come out from England to try and reconcile his sons. It's, just, it's not edifying, let's put it that way. And, and you can imagine the Dutch around there just scratching their heads. Who are these wild people and why are they here? Um, again, they did not want to compromise with anybody. Um, not in their own church, not with other churches. It made, them, it made them rather uncomfortable guests for the Dutch, right? If you're in someone else's house or in someone else's space, you probably need to adapt to their ways of doing things to a certain way if you don't if you want to be invited again let's put it that way you know if you're a guest in someone's house you know that you adapt to their ways of doing things otherwise it makes life rather difficult for your hosts um, the development of churches continued by 1607 we now have a Puritan church, not a pilgrim church, but a separatist church, but a Puritan church set up in Amsterdam. These Puritans are the ones who were in England and who said we'll try and make change within the Church of England, but um, enough of them were merchants or soldiers and they were traveling outside of England that they petitioned the Dutch government to be able to set up a church in Amsterdam. And they were actually given that authorization. Um, and these Puritans were actually easier to get along with. The Dutch government had kind of a better understanding of who they were, and they weren't as contentious, so that was generally good. Um, and interestingly, the salaries of the pastors, of the, right? Because the Dutch government paid the salaries for its own pastors, mm -hmm. and so they're going to pay the salaries for this English Reformed Church because it's an official church. It's not like the separatists. Do you understand the difference? Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of nice for the English Reformed. They had their church. They had their pastors. Everything went pretty well. Um, they were given a building in which to worship um, in the former Beguinage in Amsterdam, where the Beguines were, the former religious sisters, right? That's where the English Reformed Church was at the time. Um, administratively, things were a bit more complicated for this English Reformed Church, right? The separatists just ran their own affairs. Okay, they might quarrel constantly, but they're running their own affairs. The English Reformed Church had to fit within the system of Dutch classes and synods and so on and so forth. They were kind of like a, a different language church within the Dutch Reformed <coughs> orbit. So it's, it's, a, it's a little more of an adjustment there. Uh, and they had to conform to the doctrines and the practices of the Dutch Reformed Church. English uh, congregations were set up elsewhere as well. Rotterdam, The Hague, Leiden. Okay, all of these places end up having English <coughs> congregations. Some of them separatist, some of them Puritan official kind of uh, uh, accepted uh, churches. There are also chaplains for the English troops. Um, pastors for the English merchant adventurer communities. So there's, there's a fair presence of English Protestants in the Dutch Republic in the early 17th century. All right, we're now switching over to problems. Some of these we've already talked about, these internal disputes. I'm not going to go through them every single time, but I'm trying to categorize <laughs> them for you. Um, one set of problems was really around worship. What is the right way to worship? Uh, the separatists did not agree among themselves. 
The separatists and the Puritans were not always in agreement either. We saw the controversy over baptism with Smith, right? That was a problem. Um, one issue was whether the authority is vested in the congregation or in representatives of the congregation, right? Are we going to go for a congregationalist model? Are we going to go for a Presbyterian model where there are representatives like elders and a council and so on and so forth? Um, in general, not surprisingly, pastors tended to favor representative authority. And lay people tended to prefer congregational authority because they got more of a voice in what was happening. We talked about the behavioral issues causing problems, the fashion choices of the pastor's wife being a problem. Um, there were tensions as well between the two communities, right? If you're in one of the Puritan English Reformed churches, the official churches, is it okay to go and hear a separatist sermon or not, right? There's a little bit of question there. Where, where do you belong? Where is your space, right? Um, and then um, there was a question between English practices and Dutch practices, which were not the same theologically or in terms of worship style. Do we conform to the Dutch model, or do we do our own thing? And that, that was, in fact, a challenge. Um, the separatists, again, have no qualms to tell the Dutch where they went wrong. So that's a fascinating <laughs> document. Reformed churches. OK, they're in the Dutch Republic, and now they're presenting a document to their hosts telling them where they went wrong. OK, let's look at these. Number one. The Dutch Reformed Church in Amsterdam is not one church. It should be one church. It isn't. There's no way to check attendance. That's not good. The pastors do not uphold the importance of observing the Sabbath. Okay, you saw my sheet. This is what they like. Okay? And there's no way to have a functioning system of excommunication. So we don't approve of that. <laughs> Number two, second thing we don't like. The Dutch Reformed Church baptizes all infants, not simply the children of full members. Now you have to understand that. Because the Dutch Reformed Church was the official church of the Dutch Republic, the pastors were obligated to baptize anyone who came, right? Whether or not they were members, they were entitled to have the baby baptized in the Reformed Church. The separatists did not approve this at all. The Dutch Reformed Church uses other prayers than the Lord's Prayer in its worship. Well, the separatists didn't think that was good. <coughs> Excuse me. The Dutch Reformed Church does not practice Christ's injunctions about church discipline properly. Um, they use formerly Catholic buildings for their worship services, and that seemed like a really unfair critique, because honestly, the Dutch Reformed were making use of the worship spaces that they had. They were former Catholic churches. They had been now used for Reformed worship, and it wasn't that they were still Catholic, but the separatists thought this was inappropriate and told their Dutch hosts so. <coughs> pastors are not following scriptures by being paid for their work by the government. Okay, that's both a critique of the Dutch Reformed and actually of the English Reformed Church whose salaries pastors were being paid by the government. And you wonder sometimes if this is also a little bit of <coughs> jealousy, right? We don't get our salaries paid by the government. How come you do? Well, you're not scriptural. We are. Uh, the Dutch Reformed Church elects its elders for a one-year term, but the elders should be appointed for life. The Dutch Reformed Church conducts weddings in church, but weddings are a civil matter. They should not take place there. In church discipline, the Dutch Reformed Church used suspension from the Lord's Supper as a remedy, but it's not advocated by Christ. And the Dutch Reformed Church marks the feast days of Christ's birth. That would be Christmas. Resurrection, that would be Easter and Ascension, and the Separatists did not approve of this either. They think those feast days are too superstitious. There's too many weird practices involved, and we shouldn't be doing that. OK, well, all right, so imagine you're the Dutch Reform and you receive this document. How do you feel? <laughs> not good, kind of annoyed, right? Who are these people who come in and tell us, not only they have their quarreling, but now they're telling us where we're doing things wrong, OK? It does not go well. Um, the Dutch Reformed are very frustrated with the separatists after a while and think that these people are just problematic. Uh, they're okay with the English Reformed, but the separatists, bah, it's, just, it's just too big of a problem. Um, and so you get a situation where the Dutch government tends to be welcoming at first to all of these English exiles but increasingly does not consider the separatists to be real churches. 
they consider them sects eventually and not real churches. The English Reformed Church, that's okay, but the separatists, no thank you. We don't really want that. Um, the question then is what happens to these uh, churches in terms of especially economic and social issues? And, and the problem here is that moving to another country for these English exiles was tough. Um, many of them had been relatively prosperous in England. Again, I said they were often farming, right? They're living a fairly prosperous life as yeoman farmers. They have some land. They're not just, you know, poor. And then they come to the Netherlands and they can't get farmland. So they end up working in, like, the textile industry. And those are low-paid jobs, kind of hard work, manual labor. It's not what they were accustomed to. I mean, farming is manual labor, right? Okay. But when you're the farm owner, you have a different kind of relationship to the tasks than if you are the farm hand. And many of these pilgrims, these separatists, had been farm owners. But they come to the Dutch Republic and they can't do that, so they're working with their hands in manual labor and they're tired and they're not making enough money. And they don't have enough space. They're crowded into houses. Sometimes there's illness. They're just a little depressed about their economic situation. It hasn't hasn't turned out the way they had hoped, okay? They're more scraping a living rather than being successful. That's one problem. <clears throat> the language continued to be a barrier. Some people learned some Dutch, some people learned no Dutch and just tried to function in English. Um, they tend to live close to each other, so they have support, which is great. But as you know, if you live in an enclave where all the people around you speak the language of your home, that's wonderful, but you sure don't, lose, don't learn the language of the people around you. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge for them. And in that situation of feeling a bit like strangers in a strange land, their kids, again coming back to this problem, were going to school, right, in Dutch. And they're learning Dutch, and they're playing with Dutch children, and they're getting very comfortable in the language, and that's fine. But language and culture kind of go together, right? And if the Dutch children say, hey, come, let's go skating on the canal, and mom and dad don't think that's an appropriate pastime, especially not on Sunday afternoon, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to fit that with this is who we are, this is our sense of ourselves, these are the, the, the kind of customs and practices of our faith, and now around us, those practices don't seem to be valued in the same way, right? Where, where do we fit, right? Who are we? And, and that generational tension, that's a real problem. And it's actually still true today, right? If you talk to people who are immigrants, one of the biggest challenges they have, the worries they have, is about the second generation, right? And the relation between first generation immigrant parents and second generation children who grow up in the new culture, that's actually very difficult, right? Because it feels like your children are moving away in terms of their language, in terms of what they do, in terms of their, their interests, their food choices. You, know, you can feel for the parents. They feel why some of the separatists said, for economic reasons and for the sake of the second generation, we need to move again. We need a fresh start. We need somewhere where we can be on our own Okay? and do our own thing and not be influenced by the surrounding culture. And going back to England is not a good option because it's still a problem in England to be a separatist. And staying in the Dutch Republic, it feels like this is our, like our middle road. This is, this is not where we're meant to be. Okay? And now you can find and see why people thought, well, hey, the new world, maybe <coughs> that's where we should be. Maybe that's a fresh start. <coughs> For ourselves, for our kids, we can have land again, we can be farmers again. And as far as they were concerned, there was nobody there. Right? They don't think of Native Americans as being there, right? As far as they're concerned, it's empty, which is not true. Okay. And so they're thinking, hey, great, we can go there and our kids won't be influenced by anybody and they'll still be fully in our system and it will be great. Okay, can you see that how that is? Okay. So that, some of that pressure to move again, that's where it comes out of those economic and social tensions. At the same time, there are some of the separatists who articulate 
their story, right? The, how they come to move eventually to North America. And they see it not so much that things were difficult in the Netherlands, but that almost things were too easy. In other words, that they were not living fully faithfully to God, not fully trusting all the way to North America. So the question then is, well, what happened? What happened to the churches in the Dutch Republic over the longer term? Well, by and large, they dwindled. Okay, they didn't all leave. It's not true that all of the separatists in the Dutch Republic end up on the Mayflower. In fact, if you look carefully, uh, John Robinson, who was a pastor of the church in Leiden, and he was very well known. And of all the um, church leaders, uh, the English church leaders at the time, he was the most collaborative, the most willing to find common ground with others. Um, and in fact, a lot of people wanted him to be one of the leaders to go to the New World, simply because he was so good at getting on with other people, which honestly was rare among the separatists. Okay, So this plaque is in Leiden, and it says, in memory of John Robinson, pastor of the English church in Leiden. Okay? And it was the one who essentially developed some of the ideas behind the Mayflower, and he was supposed to move to the New World after the Mayflower went in like the second or third voyage, but he died right by 1625, so he never got to go. So he stayed in Leiden and is buried in Leiden, <coughs> in the Fiederskip in, in Leiden. You can actually find his tomb. Okay, so you have some pastors who did not actually make the change, and some lay people who also stayed in the Dutch Republic. Um, the Dutch episode, these, this time in the, in the Dutch Republic had provided some good things, right, for these English, for these godly, right? They had a time of respite, respite right? They weren't being persecuted actively in the Dutch Republic. They found some measure of safety, so that was good. Um, they were able to be their own community, but they felt that they were still under some kind of subtle pressure. <coughs> Excuse me from the Dutch lifestyle, from the more free aspects of Dutch culture that they didn't feel they fit in with. Um, some of the English who remained in the Dutch Republic, even after the Mayflower sailed, right, after that group left, they actually ended up going back to England after the death of Charles I, the English king who succeeded James. Right, Charles I, he ends up executed the English Civil War, there's the Commonwealth, Oliver, Crom <coughs> Oliver Cromwell, and um, at that point, the godly in the Dutch Republic say, finally, England is on the right track. We're going to go home to England, right? So they don't stay. So some people leave to go to the New World. Some people wait a little while, and then once the Commonwealth is underway, they head back to England. Um, but there are some who do stay. Right? There's some English people who do stay, and eventually they do acculturate completely to Dutch culture. Right? They join, they marry Dutch people. Um, you might find some English names yet, sometimes with English origin names within Dutch culture. Um, but they, what, the, what the separatists fear does actually happen. There's not a sufficiently large group of English people for them to consider to be a consistent separate community. And they do amalgamate and join into Dutch culture and become part of the Dutch people uh, entirely. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lesser known story that I think is a really important story to know about because it helps us to think more about the challenges and choices and not to have a sort of simple narrative of, OK, England, New England, but to understand that it's a process where people are maybe going through time where they're trying to figure out, OK, who are we? What is our identity? What do we hold most dear? And how do we want to maintain this? Especially in a culture that seemed in, at the same time to be very familiar and welcoming, but at the same time also one where there were still tensions about how do you live your full Christian life. All right, I want to stop at this point and let you ask some questions, because I know I've covered a lot of ground. Questions, comments, things you want to ask about? Yes? OK, in the Christian Reformed Church, 
there in years past was something known as the separatists. Mm -hmm. Could is this somehow connected? So the question is, in the Christian Reformed Church in the past, there were some known as the separatists. Is this connected? I would say the idea is very similar. It's not a direct link. Like it's not like the separatists of the 17th century in England can connect up to the separatists, and they are mostly in the 19th century in the Netherlands, okay. and they have similar ideas. So in the in the CRC history, right? These separatists were ones who finally objected to the state church in the Netherlands, okay. right? And they said, this is not who we should be. Um, it is shaped by other movements that have happened in between, including especially pietism, right? So a different sense of what it means to follow Jesus away from the institutional church and more with a heart religion, right? Um, it has similar motivations okay. to the 17th century separatists. And there were certainly texts that the English separatists wrote that were translated into Dutch that were very popular, but in 17th century Dutch Republic. Um, it's not, I don't think you could trace a direct line, but it's definitely similar kinds of concerns. Absolutely. That's a very good question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes? How, how large was this first group that went? How large was the first group that went? So the Church of Robert Brown that came over with him if there were 50 families, that would be probably as big as it got. And it is a group that's a very fluctuating number, right? Because some people go over to the Dutch Republic and then they go back home again. Um, family members might keep some in England and some in the Dutch Republic and then shift back and forth, right? So there's, there's some toing and froing going on. So it varies. But it's a varied size, but 50 families probably is as big as it got. And they're not huge. I mean, they can't be huge because they're not able to worship in public. They have to worship in people's homes. And there's a limit to how many people you can fit in that kind of community. Um, if the communities got a bit larger, they did move so that some of the churches like Rotterdam or Leiden or Harlem or something are kind of offshoots of the original groups when they get a bit large and there's other economic opportunities or people say, look, there's just not enough space for all of us in its town. We'll go over here instead. Um, the 17th century is the Dutch Golden Age, right? It's a prosperous time in the Dutch Republic. So there is work. It's not like they can't find work. But the work might not be what they hoped, right? But they are definitely able to move to different places and set up their little communities. But none of them are very big. No. But other, other ships came too with people. Absolutely. So, so if you're talking about the New World, right, then like the Mayflower and after that, the Mayflower itself is, again, not a huge number of folks. And not all the people on the Mayflower were pilgrim separatists. Some of them are servants, some of them are adventurers, some of them are just kind of on the trip, basically. Um, the pilgrims who went on the Mayflower, that was sort of group one, and that's Plymouth, right? The Puritans set up separately, and they do that about three or four years later, and they're way better organized, they have more ships, and they're the ones who settle around Boston, right? And they actually do a lot better. They're better organized, they have kind of a plan. Um, the separatists, that first voyage, they, they set out too late in the year. They arrive and it's winter. People die of starvation and scurvy and all sorts of problems. The Puritans who go, you know, three years later, they set out much better time of the year. They arrive in the summertime. You know, it's just it's just better thought out. They have more money behind them too. And so it's the Boston colony that becomes the bigger colony by far. Um, the Plymouth colony survives, but it's more shaky. Um, the, the, the big the Boston community is the, the stronger one, the better organized one by far. Yeah. Other questions, comments, things to think about? So over here first. I think that you mentioned the Volcano off yes. in Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, that's a place I think that tourists still go to visit. I remember visiting it when we were in the Netherlands. And there was an American-speaking church in that little it's spot. In that space. And, and uh, it was something that but they did talk about how those people were the Puritans that went to the to America after that. So, uh, are some of these other places where, like you mentioned, uh, Middleburg and yes. wherever the other something, are there still spots where you can 
visit to see where they were worshiping at that time? Okay, so the good question. So the question is, you know, in, in Amsterdam you can visit the Beginage, the Beginhof, where they where they worshipped, um, the English church worship. Um, the problem their own church buildings and they worshiped in private homes and these ones have not survived largely. There is a museum in Leiden which you can visit which has sort of, it's called like the Pilgrim Museum or something like that. It's not big, it's two rooms, but the man who runs it is very keen to tell you everything that can be known about the stay of the pilgrims in Leiden, okay? That would be John Robinson's group. Um, and so he's kind of made it his life mission to do this little tiny, it's a two room museum, but he's very proud of it. So you can go to that. Um, there are some areas that still bear the name, uh, the angles of port, so the English sort of zone or, or area. Um, and that's where the English people have settled. And you can see some of the small homes and alleyways and so on. But there's nothing that you could point to and say, OK, this person lived here and I can visit it now. And it's the same as it was back then. Um, it's, it's the problem of being a separatist, is that you don't have a big footprint, right? Um, and so you will find other churches like um, in Leiden, you can go to the Pieterskirk and find the burial place for Robinson, for instance. And some of the other English, you'll find their burial places. But that doesn't mean that they worshiped in that church. It's just that's where they're buried. So it's a little more difficult to unpack it. It's a bit like trying to find evidence of another group that I have taught on, and Marilyn suggests I might do a class on it, um, the Anabaptists. Um, small groups that are not official and are kind of hidden away, it's very hard to find their tracks because they were hidden away, right? They don't advertise. They don't have an official spa space. Excuse me. Good question. And back here, yes? Um, well, I'm just thinking when you were talking about Middleburg, which is in Zealand, yep. um, people did go to Leg, but my, my, my grandparents came from Amsterdam, and my mother was born in Zealand. Yes. But many of them, or at least my family, would go to Leiden to study because yes. that's where the, the universities, universities were. Yep. So I think that was part of it. Yes. So the question is Leiden and why Leiden was so important. Leiden has a university from 1575 onwards. And the story goes Leiden heroically resisted um, the attempts to attack from the Spanish side. And in return for their bravery, they were offered a reward, and they picked the university as their reward. And in fact, that was a, then a connection, because university education in the 16th century, just like today English is kind of an international language, Latin was the international language of education in the 16th century and the 17th century. So English people could study at Leiden, because they didn't need to know Dutch, so long as they knew Latin, which they had learned, they would be fine. Right? So there's, there's a lot of connection there. Um, the world of printing is a connection point uh, because these English separatists and Puritans are writing books and publishing them, and then they're being translated into Dutch. Right, So they, uh, a lot of the English writings of this period were very influential in the 17th century Dutch world in the what's called the Nadere Reformatie, the Second Reformation. And the Dutch who were part of that movement, that Second Reformation, they really liked the Puritan texts, and they translated them into Dutch. So there's a connection there as well. So it's education, it's printing, right? It's contacts that, that really flourish. And you have to think, the Dutch and the English, two maritime nations, right? There's trade going back and forth. So there's a connection that's sort of a very organic one that helps also build these places. If you think, well, why didn't they go to France? Or why didn't they go to Denmark or something like that? Uh, Den France was Catholic. Denmark was Lutheran, right? And the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, is also reformed. And that made it a very good winning option for these, for these English uh, people who wanted to be able to live out their faith in a way that they felt they couldn't in England at the time. Question, yes? Where does the founding of New Amsterdam Fit into right, so the founding of New Amsterdam, that's a good question. It doesn't have anything really to do with the Pilgrims or the Puritans. It was completely the work of the uh, Dutch, um, who were essentially merchants and traders, and they wanted to establish trading posts. And one of the trading posts they established was on what's now Manhattan, 
right? And so this was a Dutch foothold on the North American continent. Everyone's trying to get footholds, right? The Spaniards, the French, the British. Um, everyone's trying to get a foothold on this continent. Um, and the Dutch took New Amsterdam as their foothold, and it's really for trade. So it wasn't for faith reasons. It wasn't anything really to do with the Pilgrims and the Puritans. Um, it's not even very clear. The, the Dutch did send over some pastors, but they were particularly for the people who were living there who were Dutch, not for like contacts with the Native Americans or anything like that. So it's, it's part of the bigger story of the Dutch Golden Age and the Dutch Overseas Empire and not really much to do with the Pilgrims and the Puritans, except for the fact that as more and more people turn up in New England, that area grows more and more crowded. And then the people in New England start looking southwards and say, hmm, it would be sure nice if we could spread down to where New Amsterdam is. So there's, there's that kind of tension over time. But that's a more of an economic and a demographic tension than anything else. Good question, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have covered a lot of ground. And this is fantastic. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I will be keeping in touch with Jackie, and we'll find hopefully other times when I can come and tell you more exciting stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.